Our final speaker of the session is uh, someone I know quite well. Alex, are you there? Happy to be with you. And I would like to thank the organizers and uh, uh, Morton and Daniela for putting such a great conference together uh, and inviting me to present. Um, my presentation today is going to focus on aging clocks. Uh, as you know, uh, I wear several hats and the tiny hat I wear Uh, the uh, one of the sponsors of the conference, uh, and um, I'll share my screen. Perfect, I hope you can see it. Um, and I don't want to go over time, uh, that's why I will rush through a lot of slides. So basically, Deep Longevity is a specialist uh, specializing in aging clock development. It's currently part of the Endurance Longevity, Hong Kong publicly traded company. Uh, the ticker symbol is 0575, not an investment advice. Uh, it's, uh, it's a lecture on a product. I'm going to be covering um, aging clock applications and pharma longevity medicine and insurance. Uh, regular disclaimer, uh, so no forward-looking statements. We're talking about something that is already public. It's actually the burden of being a public company. Uh, and uh, Deep Longevity is a spin-off uh, out of Encelico Medicine, which was acquired by um, Endurance Longevity. The chairman of Endurance Longevity is Jim Mellon, who many of you know uh, from Juvenescence uh, and other longevity startups. Um, so at Deep Longevity, uh, we proposed this paradigm in about 2015, 2016, where we can use uh, massive longitudinal data sets uh, to train deep neural networks to uh, predict chronological age in a healthy state and also other, um, and using transfer learning where we predict the chronological age and the health status at the same time. And then we derive pathways, targets, causal graphs, and even generate synthetic data into the future using generative adversarial networks uh, or generative for, uh, reinforcement learning. And our first clocks were actually in transcriptomics. Uh, we started developing them in uh, uh, 2015, uh, 2014, 2015. Uh, did, did some work in proteomics as well. Uh, however, the first clock, the first deep aging clock that we published in a peer-reviewed journal was in 2016. Uh, that's the blood age, a hematological aging clock, which was uh, trained on just very basic parameters from your regular clinical lab test. And then we've developed uh, and published uh, um, 17 clocks. Currently, internally, we have a portfolio of, if you, you can count uh, them, it's probably about 100 because some of our application specific uh, in 2018, uh, we've uh, demonstrated that uh, uh, some of those aging clocks are population specific. Uh, they are also very predictive of mortality uh, and uh, um, predictive for, of uh, the effects of the various interventions. Uh, we've uh, published the first transcriptomic aging clock in 2018, uh, but uh, patented it, I think, before that, a year before that, and also the proteomic aging clock. Um, and uh, then in uh, 2019, we got it granted. Uh, 2020, uh, we published uh, in a peer-reviewed journal uh, the microbiomic aging clock. Um, we had it on archive uh, since 2018. Uh, and then we also published um, in 2020 uh, the first uh, deep learning clock, uh, uh, clock developed using deep learning on methylation data. Uh, and also in 2020, we published something that's uh, super fun and that I'm going to talk about today, uh, the psychological aging clock. So humans, unlike many other um, species, uh, are very conscious of aging and death. Uh, so we change our uh, psychology uh, in time, and we decided to also link that to, um, to biological aging clocks. Uh, so I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. We started implementing those clocks in the clinic and the insurance industry in pharmaceutical companies very early. And uh, uh, we're trying to create an ecosystem around that. Um, we are trying to also develop many, many clocks on different data types, imaging, uh, molecular uh, data, uh, epigenetic data, uh, to try to capture the hallmarks of aging and I'll go even beyond that because currently, um, I subscribe to the belief that there is no master clock. Uh, there are many, many. So you, you're, you're comprised of millions of different clocks, ticking at different rates, responding to different interventions, and uh, being applied in different applications. 
So we need to look at multiple different uh, levels of organization, develop those clocks at different uh, levels of organization, and also trying to train uh, the deep neural networks on multiple uh, data types at the same time. And that's where deep neural networks are good at. So you can either create multiple deep neural networks trained on different data types or train on uh, different data types, uh, the one model. Uh, what we are doing right now is basically trying to fragment that into multiple clocks and then create a weighted average, which is the deep integrative uh, aging clock. We call it age metric. Uh, and the optimal idea, that uh, optimal strategy for us uh, for deep longevity is to identify uh, some of the clocks and some of the biomarkers that could be turned into actionable targets and uh, pathways uh, that could be tweaked to try to get you closer to the optimal age in your lifespan, which is uh, probably 20 to 40 uh, in terms of performance. We need to look at the age of Olympic athletes for that, right? So we can argue that you maintain performance um, and uh, attractiveness during your entire life. But as we see from beauty competitions and Olympic games, uh, that's currently not the case. But we want to ensure that even those features uh, continue to be running for your entire life. Uh, we've developed uh, a lot of clocks, as I've mentioned. So we have digital clocks uh, that are based on behavior, um, uh, surveys, survey data, imaging. We collaborate with Hout AI uh, to uh, identify new features uh, that can be implemented in imaging clocks and also in biological clocks. Uh, we have heart rate variability clocks, uh, microbiomic aging clocks, methylation, transcriptomics, hematological aging clocks, and also combination of many. So depending on the application and depending on the pharmaceutical that you are testing, sometimes you don't know what the drug is impacting. And I'm very happy to be following near uh, on, on this presentation. It's going to be very difficult to kind of follow um, the giant and his footsteps. But uh, I think that next year we're going to celebrate the 100th anniversary of metformin. And we still do not know how it works very well, right? Uh, because in most of the studies, we do not measure everything, right? So we do not measure multiple data types that we should measure to understand where it works and where it is uh, influencing the aging clocks. And uh, now I'm going to switch gears a little bit to talk about biorelevance of aging clocks. Uh, so now we have a lot of experience uh, in this field. Again, our first peer-reviewed paper on deep learning applications uh, to aging clocks was in May 2016 uh, in aging. Uh, we did the presentations on this clock even in 2015. Um, sometimes I'm very disappointed that now people are getting to use deep learning quite a bit and are not citing our paper. Uh, but in this paper, we demonstrated several things. Well, one is that we can now predict the chronological age in a more or less healthy state using deep learning, using very simple data types like blood tests. Uh, and we can do permutation feature importance, so to see how each individual feature contributes to the accuracy of the prediction. And also, we can now pinpoint the uh, importance of those features to specific organ systems. And we also, in the paper, showed that, in general, uh, you can see that um, people who are predicted to be older, they usually have more morbidities, more diseases, uh, than people who are predicted to be younger. And you can also try to link that to uh, individual diseases. We later expanded that work and uh, uh, de de developed a very simple aging clock, 31 markers, uh, all in known criminals, uh, known, to, um, uh, known to physicians. So physicians are very comfortable interpreting this data type um, uh, and, and link those to different functions, uh, different uh, blood tests. Uh, and um, we demonstrated that this clock uh, is very predictive of mortality. So in different populations, if you are five years or older than your chronological age, uh, the hazard ratio goes significantly, uh, significantly higher. And if you are five years or younger than your chronological age, um, you are much less likely uh, to die of any cause than if you are at your chronological age or older. Uh, so people with higher pace of aging have double the mortality rate uh, compared to normal agers. Uh, and we published that in uh, uh, Gerontology Section 8. Uh, took us a while to publish as a hardcore journal. Um, uh, so um, but that was the first time when we demonstrated those uh, deep aging clocks are population specific and also predictive of mortality. 
also did that uh, on um, uh, smokers and non-smokers, uh, published in scientific reports. Uh, very recently, we um, uh, hypothesized, so last year, about uh, May timeframe, we started this project uh, where we decided to um, build a predictor of mortality uh, during COVID, with COVID infection. Uh, and we demonstrated that uh, uh, biological age is much more uh, important than the chronological age when predicting mortality in COVID patients. Uh, published it uh, and used, uh, in this case, just very simple blood-based uh, aging clocks uh, and showed uh, uh, that they are correlated with uh, COVID-related mar COVID mortality. You can actually go to the COVID risk calculator. Uh, it's uh, on app.yangai.covid. Uh, uh, put in your blood biomarker data and a few other features about the patient uh, and see how much uh, uh, time does the patient has have uh, on this planet. Uh, so ex expected time to death. Uh, it's a scientific uh, exercise, not, uh, not a marketing tool. Um, we do not sell this uh, uh, to, to anyone, but uh, and, and, and when we make sure that there is proper disclaimer that you, know, you should not use it to, 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 to make decision, clinical decisions. Uh, but we uh, used a pretty large uh, data set to develop this clock and to validate it. Uh, and we also developed the methylation aging clock uh, using deep learning. Of course, we are not the original inventor of methylation aging clocks in any way. We do not claim leadership in this space. Um, I actually think that methylation is much less informative than uh, other data types. I think that the most important clock, if I were to focus on just something, I would focus on transcriptomics and proteomics on dual clock. Um, well, and if possible, also get meth methylation at the same time. But I think that methylation is also very important uh, because nowadays it's a huge uh, field. Everybody is going to this, uh, and you can also modulate this field with epigenetic reprogramming. Uh, so currently, I think it's either most uh, accurate or the one of the most accurate clocks with 2.7 year on a uh, test set. So it's uh, uh, it's uh, much better accuracy than the original papers. Uh, we also demonstrated that the uh, deep uh, methylation aging clock um, uh, detects uh, people with dementia, ovarian cancer, uh, multiple sclerosis, uh, uh, ulcerative colitis, and many others. So there is a clear correlation. Uh, we also published uh, in 2000 uh, uh, in peer-reviewed journal, but before that in uh, uh, on archive since 2018, together with Vadim Gladyshev's lab. I uh, deeply admire uh, that lab and that scientist. Um, uh, the first microbionic aging clock, where we demonstrated that we can predict uh, a human uh, uh, chronological age uh, using mic mi mi microbiome data, whole genome sequencing, and also uh, uh, my, 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 my cheaper data types, uh, and demonstrated that um, uh, we can now classify some of the bacteria in seno, uh, positive and seno negative. So bacteria that make your gut, quote unquote, look younger to the deep neural net and bacteria that uh, make your gut, quote unquote, look older to the deep neural net. So we can also see the permutation feature importance, deep feature selection of those bacteria, and uh, even hypothesize on what kind of probiotics we can design to make your gut, quote unquote, look younger to the deep neural net. Doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to make you younger in any way. Um, and then uh, we decided that, you know, since we're studying aging clocks, why don't we look at psychology and uh, look at how human uh, outlook on life and how human behavior and psychology changes in time. And, you know, I think that I would not be able to make friends with myself 20 years ago. And I'm not sure if I will be very friendly to myself 20 years after. Uh, so it's just people change so much in time. And uh, we hypothesized that now we can build um, uh, age predictor, chronological age predictors in a healthy state and also subjective age predictors. So that's how, uh, that's basically humans can answer these questions um, when you ask them, how old do they feel, uh, either psychologically and physically. And that's something that you cannot ask the animal, but you can ask the human. Uh, and usually it's a very good marker. And we can now utilize uh, some other data types to support this uh, human uh, decision-making and the feeling that they get uh, to, to support their answers with biological clocks so they learn how to properly answer this question. Uh, and psychology is something that we can actually change uh, 
as humans. So we, we don't, don't have a lot of control over aging. We can diet, exercise, sleep. But now, can we also identify some features to think younger uh, and to behave as younger people? Can we maintain the same level of creativity? So those clocks might help you answer those questions. And what we did, we basically looked at um, uh, a large number of parameters that we can measure from surveys, uh, looked at specifically modifiable factors, and those factors that are not directly correlated with chronological age. So for example, you know, kids' age or parental age uh, or age of death of family members is something that you cannot control. And in theory, like age of spouse uh, is something that gives out your chronological age very easily. So we look, started looking at modifiable factors to predict uh, psychological and subjective age and then link those factors to the different factors of well-being, such as physical health, uh, mental health, resilience to stress, productivity, happiness. So now we are started working on the happiness clock as well and on longevity. Uh, and we built a predictor. So we uh, used a very large uh, data set uh, in the U.S. called MIDAS, Midlife Study in the U.S., where um, tens of thousands of people are being surveyed every year um, for all kinds of purposes. Uh, there are more than a thousand uh, um, features in that survey. Uh, and we used uh, that filter for uh, identifying the most important features uh, and to predict the uh, psychological age and also subjective age. So they actually have that feature, um, how old do you feel? And we demonstrated that those uh, um, clocks are very predictive of mortality as well. Uh, they predict mortality better than some of our biological aging clocks. So if you are predicted to be five years or older using the psychological age uh, predictor or subjective age predictor, you have much higher hazard ratio, in some cases twofold or threefold, um, higher mortality, uh, higher hazard ratio than uh, um, people who are predicted to be within their uh, chronological age. Uh, and if you are predicted to be younger, uh, you are expected to live longer. And subjective age is actually a much uh, stronger determinant of mortality than uh, psychological age, which is chronological age in a healthy state. So now we can give you a, a bunch of surveys and predict uh, when you die. And then we can figure out how to correct that. And actually one of the, we also can predict uh, now age and uh, predicted age and uh, uh, depression. So correlated with depression and many other um, uh, psychological conditions. And we started using um, uh, self-organizing maps here. So it's kind of a way to cluster uh, patients uh, in um, subjects uh, uh, in multidimensional space. And then looking at how to move those subjects from one um, uh, state to another state. So with depression and psychologically older and without depression and psychologically younger. Uh, and um, you, you, uh, by, by modifying the various features. So uh, now I, we can show a path consisting of incremental changes that uh, lead to mental stability. So uh, we can now achieve an island of mental stability and younger psychological age at the same time. So you can see that we have uh, uh, the mental stability hotspot here and the uh, depression hotspot. So we want to, to, to move people from here to here uh, using very simple uh, behavioral interventions, uh, modifications, or um, some uh, quote unquote, self-deception practices. Uh, so actually one of the uh, hypotheses that I have is that if you attend ARDD conferences, you are likely to feel psychologically younger. Uh, so if your friends want to uh, become psychologically younger, it's a good idea to learn about aging research in general and uh, uh, become more optimistic about their health because the most important feature that you can change right now and the easiest one to change uh, to be looking, quote unquote, younger to the uh, age predictor using psychological um, aging features that we're tracking is uh, to stretch your longevity expectations and to have a um, uh, more optimistic outlook on the near term and long term um, health status, uh, the way you see yourself in the future. So now let's, let me shift gears to the applications. Uh, I hope not to run too much over time because we're already over time. So. Well, aging clocks can be applied in many areas. We've heard this so many times over during this conference. Uh, uh, so now aging clocks are a trend. When we entered the industry, uh, they were just becoming to becoming a trend. And of course, uh, Stephen Horvath did a gargantuan amount of work. So deep bow to uh, Horvath and Hannum and then uh, Morgan Levin who picked it up. Um, 
Uh, so we were also one of the kind of early entrants. And we started uh, playing around with aging clocks uh, originally in uh, uh, the clinics and diagnostics and also target discovery and just understanding the fundamental biology a little bit better. Um, so we've partnered with uh, uh, several dozen clinics now uh, uh, or piloted. Uh, one of the main ones is human longevity. They also invested in deep longevity, uh, the human longevity in San Diego and Beijing. Uh, insurance companies. Um, now we're uh, looking for multiple different uh, ways to partner and employers. So if you can reverse the age of your employees and uh, actually even starting with psychological age to um, try to keep them in a more innovative mode and uh, more future friendly, um, you can also employ those clocks and get them to, uh, to learn about longevity. So it's clearly a market trend. So health and well-being market is $4.2 trillion market in just 2017. Very unfortunately, aging clocks and uh, uh, longevity in general, so credible longevity science, is not yet part of this market uh, and is not taking a huge percentage of this market. It should. So we need to aim that. And we need to probably start with insurance. Uh, it's one of the very conservative industries, uh, as conservative as the pharmaceutical industry, $4.15 trillion globally. Uh, in the U.S., uh, very large, per, uh, contrary to the popular uh, opinion, a uh, very large population of the um, U.S. Uh, is insured. Uh, of course, that's uh, overall insurance trends. Uh, for life insurance, it's uh, much lower, but still people uh, try to get life insurance. And the very elite uh, or people who are wealthy, uh, they try to go for ultra high premium um, life insurance. So to ensure that it's basically, it's an investment product. So there you can offer many more biomarkers and uh, uh, you can provide an additional uh, package of uh, uh, healthcare services to be able to track uh, the effects of those healthcare, uh, healthcare services on uh, longevity uh, of the person, also aging clocks. So the way we start uh, uh, kind of approaching the uh, insurance industry is to uh, provide the better underwriting a decision making, so uh, understanding when to in increase or de decrease the uh, premiums depending on the aging clocks. Very, very simple clocks, very often non invasive. And also for customer acquisitions. So, acquisition, so uh, utilizing psychological surveys and uh, other minimally invasive surveys, you can see where people might need and might want to have life insurance. And we can bring those, uh, this clientele to insurance companies. And of course, we're extremely interested in uh, publishing in this area. Uh, and doing collaborative research. Uh, in healthcare, uh, as I've mentioned, we published, uh, we, 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 uh, we partnered with many uh, longevity clinics, some of them pre presented here, uh, and I'm extremely grateful to um, uh, Dina Rydankovic who presented on Hook. Uh, they, they are trying to integrate multiple aging clocks and play around with them uh, in a clinical context and even develop their own. So what we do is we provide uh, age metric reports uh, to those clinics um, as uh, not a recommendation system, but uh, as a decision support system and research system. Uh, however, you can very quickly narrow down the features that would make you quote unquote look younger, uh, either on blood tests uh, or on psychological aging uh, or even pictures and uh, activity. Uh, and we, we use self-organizing maps and many other uh, uh, approaches to Try to see the optimal blood parameters and other features if you are using other clocks uh, to see where you can cluster patients and how you can cluster patients so that they can look younger than uh, their chronological age. And you can see how much uh, does each individual feature contribute to your age prediction um, from a specific individual age test and see if, where, where you are doing well and where you can correct the feature. Um, in order to you, for you to for, for a patient to look younger to the deep neural net than uh, uh, than they do today, uh, so one of the major clinics that we partnered with is Human Longevity. It's probably one of the most sophisticated diagnostic provider in the world, uh, collecting over 150 gigabytes of data per every visit. You get the most granular and the deeper deepest uh, uh, insights, uh, specifically from imaging, so full body MRI. For genome sequencing, we do not use those data types. We just do blood tests, anonymized, and uh, on their system. Um, and one of the longevity physicians uh, that they employ is uh, uh, um, Evelyn Biskoff, uh, so MD, who, uh, who who is very credible. So it's Max Planck, uh, Harvard, uh, Columbia. 
uh, internships, uh, and now she is a, uh, she is a physician in multiple places and doing a lot of research publishing. Um, so she works with some of the patients, and now here uh, she yep. We gotta we gotta move on, man. Okay, sorry, <laughs> one second. We have five sorry. minutes left of the break, <laughs> and uh, Andrea also wants Ooh. to give one or two. Uh, slides about the yeah. entire longevity so program. the most most important most important uh, slide final 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 so here is a patient patient journey so first you need to also treat uh, your health as a patient as you would treat your money right so making decisions uh, as a venture capitalist uh, in this field right because uh, there are no clinically approved clocks no clinically approved uh, drugs or interventions so you need to look at what is uh, out there uh, in terms of very simple interventions uh, and try to modulate your sleep, diet, exercise uh, to see how they affect, how those very simple interventions affect the clock. So here it's very um, anonymized patient. You can see that uh, he is already younger than, our, than his uh, chronological age. Uh, and the idea is to keep him <laughs> younger. So he's already doing well, uh, but you can see that in time, so 2018 to 2020, uh, the, the patient uh, biologically aged only one year on the longevity protocol that uh, he is currently pursuing. That's very simple. Uh, and I'll skip the rest of the slides, but I just wanted to mention that if you want to learn about uh, the aging clocks in general uh, and the longevity medicine, so the new type of medicine where the physician is going to treat the patient not in the context of their age range, but in the context of their entire lifespan and optimize for the best performance in the lifespan, take the longevity medicine course. It's free on longevity of degree and it's just got CME accredited. A lot of people took it over uh, about, about 3,000 people uh, on several platforms uh, and is becoming increasingly popular. So thank you very much. Uh, here is my WeChat. Here is our, uh, here is uh, the link to the platform and I'll be very happy to answer questions on Slack. Thank Sorry you so for much. going over time. Thank you. Thank you.